Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Hart. She's an Emeritus Professor of Mathematics at Birkbeck, a University of London. Uh, she's also the 33rd Gresham Professor of Geometry, uh, actually the first woman to hold the position since its inception in 1597. And today we're talking about her book, once upon a time, the wondrous connections between mathematics and literature. So, Dr. Hart, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, so start by telling us how did you get interested in these connections between mathematics and literature, and how did you first start uh, noticing them? I think my mind has always enjoyed structures and patterns and you and they are there in literature they're there in mathematics so on a perhaps less conscious level the things that i would enjoy in part in poetry and other kinds of literature um are the same as the things i enjoy in mathematics so on that level always <laughs> but uh, kind of in a conscious way i would say that the trigger for all of the investigations i've done into these links between mathematics and literature was uh, when a friend pointed out to me or mentioned that there is a particular mathematical curve that is discussed in, in Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And so I thought, oh, well, read Moby Dick, which I hadn't done. It's one of these classic books, you know, that you're supposed to have read, but I hadn't. But I read it and it's wonderful. But throughout, I saw that there are lots of mathematical references and metaphors, allusions throughout that book and in actually lots of Melville's writing. And that really got me interested in okay, what, how has this happened? Why are there all these links? Why are there all these metaphors in this writing? And that got me into exploring more broadly the, the ma mathematical literature links uh, that, that there are in so many books and poems and, and everywhere, really. So we'll come back to Moby Dick later on. But it, it, I mean, just uh, generally speaking, in what ways does mathematics manifest in the, in the structure of literary texts so yeah at the level of structure i as a mathematician of course believe <laughs> that the best way to understand structure and pattern is is using mathematics and that's why you know it's it's so useful for science because the universe itself has lots of structure and pattern and symmetry and and mathematics is really our, our language for describing those things so for example if you have uh, a poem Poem, uh, it's difficult to say exactly what is poetry. It's hard to give a precise definition, but there will be some kind of constraint or structure, whether that's line breaks, you know, the meter, the, the rhyme scheme, if there is one, all of those structures and patterns, you can think about mathematically and you can ask questions like, well, how many ways are there to have a rhyme scheme? How many possible rhythms are there? And so mathematics underlies all of those sorts of structures. And so, uh, talking specifically about poetry, because poetry sometimes it's a bit of a weird thing. It's like mm -hmm. one of those things that we can tell when it's poetry when we see it, but it's very hard to define, right? Because there yes. are many different ways of doing poetry, and sometimes there's not even rhymes nor anything mm -hmm. like that. So. But uh, from your perspective as a mathematician, what do you find interesting about poetry and in what ways do you think that mathematics can perhaps uh, help us understand a little bit better what poetry or how poetry works? Yeah, so I think that the, the two disciplines, mathematics and poetry, they, they kind of share some sort of aesthetic sensibility, in my view, because if you're a mathematician you want to find out what the truth is and then you want to express that in as beautiful elegant and probably quite concise way as you can so if you want to prove that something is true your proof you want it to cover all the cases in in as efficient way as you can you want a nice beautiful clear piece of reasoning to get you to the end not 400 pages of case by case calculations right so meanwhile the poet wants to find the truth and express it in a beautiful way as well and usually also in in a fairly 
concise way where each phrase or each part of the poem will probably have lots of layers of interpretation. And that's one of the things we see in good poetry is you might have a metaphor that actually carries lots of meaning in just a few words. And that's kind of the same thing as we do in mathematics. We want to cover lots of meaning in a few words. And we might do that with algebra or equations, whereas in poetry, you do it with metaphors and, <laughs> and similes. So there are these aesthetic links between the two things. And lots of poets and mathematicians have, have seen these connections and, and kind of said, you know, uh, there's a famous quote by the uh, 19th century mathematician Sofia Kovalevskaya, who said, it's impossible to be a mathematician without being a poet in your soul. You know, we have, we, we are both looking for beauty and truth and we're both trying to express it in a similar kind of way. So that's one level at which they're linked. But, but at the structural level, uh, you can think about the different, different constraints that poets can apply. So there are different poetic forms. You know, a sonnet has various rules. It has a certain number of lines. It has a certain rhythm. It has a certain rhyme scheme that is different in different languages, actually. So an English sonnet tends to have a different rhyme scheme from a French sonnet, but they all will have these constraints. Within that, you can then you can be creative and explore the playground of, of what you can do. Um, mathematically, so you might say, well, you can write a sonnet without being a mathematician. Of course you can. But I think knowing and understanding, appreciating those rules, of course, you have to know what the rules are in order to be able to create the thing. But also understanding the rules allows you to, to play uh, with the form, with different kinds of form, creating new forms and, uh, and, and having fun with, with the consequences of those. So one example I give in the book is this uh, uh, French poet who, who wrote, uh, there was a little tiny book and it purported to contain a hundred trillion sonnets. <laughs> and he did that by exploiting kind of the, the mathematics of, of combining uh, poems. So what he actually had was 10, 10 poems on 10 pages. And these are sort of the seeds. Mm -hmm. And then what you can do is actually created, it's sort of a three dimensional poem because each individual sonnet on each page, those 10 sonnets respected the sonnet form and so had they had their rhyme scheme within them but then the layers of sonnets that he created so 10 sonnets kind of in a pile all of the first lines rhyme with each other all of the second lines rhyme with each other so he's made a three-dimensional poem and then what you can do is you can create more sonnets from these by picking any of the first lines and then any of the second lines and any of the third lines and so on until you've got 14 lines chosen from these 10 initial poems and so the number of sonnets that then are potentially can exist is 10 choices for the first line times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 14 times which is this hundred trillion and that's that's very cool i think that he's you know he's, he's got a three-dimensional poem which contains within it the potential for a hundred trillion sonnets so yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, and th this is very interesting because actually many times we tend to think that perhaps being a good artist, like a poet or something like that, I, I mean, the real ingredient there is to be, uh, to have as much liberty as possible in terms of uh, the creative style, but actually it seems that having some rules set in place helps one being more creative. Right. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's, it's rare to have no kind of structure at all. And even that is a choice. You then are choosing mm. to do something with randomness. Um, there's a great quote from the, the Irish poet Paul Muldoon, who said, <laughs> I've got to get this right. He said that poetic form is a constraint. OK, and it's a straitjacket in the same way that straight jackets were a straight jacket for Houdini. <laughs> okay, he's using he's using that thing to to you know to to give you something exciting, and that's what yeah. that these any kind of constraint in literature, you don't it doesn't restrict your creativity. It actually spurs you on to work within that setup, whatever you've done, whether you've you know whether it's a, a poem with a particular 
rhyme scheme or set of constraints or you know how many words or what the the, the form it has to fit into or you know various literary forms where people say okay i'm going to have this length of chapter or I, I i will have paragraphs or i won't have paragraphs or i'll have you know a stream of consciousness thing with no sentences at all all of those are choices and so it's it's not that yeah it, we will have some kind of constraint and some kind of choice and you can make those choices at every level of the, of the text and so, uh, still on the topic of poetry, in what ways can mathematics be applied to rhyme schemes? I mean, is mathematics something that poets use to create rhyme schemes or not? Yeah, so you can apply mathematics to understand what the possibilities are for okay. your rhyme schemes. So if you think of, um, in, in Western poetry, typically, what you're looking at is the stress of the words. So in your iambic pentameter, which is a kind of classic um, rhythmic meter, you've got um, kind of de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum, right? So that's uh, that's one of the choices that you can have. There are various others with with complicated classical names, which you don't need to worry about. Um, but the number of possibilities that you have, if you have a you know three syllables say you can stress the first syllable or not you can stress the second syllable or not for third syllable or not and actually that means there are eight possibilities and so you can work this out mathematically you can explore which ones are fruitful which ones are not um, but in different traditions um, there are different uh, ways in which um, the, the kinds of poetry are decided. So in kind of Indian poetry, instead of having stress or not stress, you have long and short sounds. And the number of ways of, of dividing a particular number of, you know, length of time into long and short sounds actually turns out to give you what we call the Fibonacci sequence, which is a well-known sequence that crops up all over the place in mathematics. But that sequence, which we call Fibonacci sequence because it was written down in, you know, in the West, in Europe first by this guy Fibonacci, Leonardo of Pisa, um, in about 12, gosh, 1202, somewhere around then, it had been known in India for centuries previously because it was so useful for understanding the different possibilities for structuring your poetry. So yeah, mathematics is, can be extremely useful for understanding what possibilities you have. And then of course, the artist in you can say, okay, I will choose this one and see what I can do with it. But do you know if there are many poets and other types of writers out there that actually consciously uh, structure their poems or their narratives, for example, and we'll get into novels in a second, but uh, structure basically their work uh, uh, in a conscious way mathematically. Because, I mean, we also have this very common idea, which of course might be wrong to some extent, that people who are interested in art, in literature and all of that are not very good at mathematics and vice versa. <laughs> but perhaps that's actually not true, I don't know. I, I, I think, of course I would say this, but I really don't think it's true. I think there is that stereotype and it's, mm -hmm. it's a tragedy actually of, of, and I think quite unique to, to the time that we're living in, that there is this perceived difference between mathematics and science on the one side and art and all you know creative things <laughs> yeah. as if you know the they don't and i really i mean for a start if you do mathematics at you know research mathematics level you are you have to be creative because you're you know you're you're creating and exploring new ideas you're putting ideas together in a new way and that is a, a creative thing and I feel you know as a, as a mathematician when I'm doing research I feel much more akin with you know an artist who is creating designs or, or, or a poet or a writer so that there's that thing mathematics I think it's has this it, it, it has the misfortune to be very useful <laughs> you know like it's so useful for science that that has somehow become what it's perceived to be for it's as if we said that actually the purpose of art is technical drawing or you know floor plans or something that is not the purpose of art it happens to be useful to be able to draw if you're going to be I don't know an architect or, or design machines but that's not what art is for and you know for me that's not what mathematics is for it just happens that 
it's very useful. But that's not all it is. So it, this perceived difference is really not there. If you look you know, on close inspection, there have always been uh, writers and poets who, who have enjoyed mathematics. Mathematics itself uh, in many cultures. So if you, you know, in Sanskrit um, mathematics, it was passed on by an oral tradition that meant it was put into poetry. So books about mathematics um, from from India, you know, a thousand years ago, they are poems and the problems are posed as poems, really beautiful poems about, you know, there's, there's one I quote in Once Upon a Prime about um, a lovely little uh, algebraical problem, but it's about um, a swarm of bees flying from one flower to the next and they some of them stop on this flower and some of them stop on this flower and the question is to work out to how many bees there were in total so you get this lovely poetry um which is describing mathematics and you get mathematicians who are also poets uh like omar khayyam famous for the rubaiyat uh the, the, we, we still we still read also did really brilliant work in in algebra um, and, and proved results that were not known in the West for, for 400 or so more years uh, using clever geometrical arguments. But of course, we now we remember him now as a poet, but he was these other things as well. So, yeah, actually, this dichotomy isn't really there <laughs> in my view. Right. So talking about novels now, can mathematics be used to, for example, structure a story? Yes, absolutely. And in, there are several ways this can happen. So one way is by actually thinking about components of your story and how you're going to put them together. For instance, uh, in terms of actual structure and length of, of the writing, um, one example I like to talk about is, is The Luminaries, which uh, was Eleanor Catton's wonderful novel that won the Booker Prize in 2013. And she had lots going on in the book, lots of structure and themes, her kind of an overarching theme in the book was the interplay between chance and fate and how much we're in control of our destiny or not. And to illustrate that, um, she associates, there are 12 uh, important characters, she associates them in some way to the signs of the zodiac. And then there are two um, main characters, the lovers who are the luminaries, the sun and the moon. And so there's a lot of astrological information that she deploys the 12 characters with their zodiac signs she looks at kind of where the stars were in the sky at the exact time the events are set and to some extent their actions are uh influenced by by that uh you know in terms of what the characters will do so she does that not necessarily because she believes in astrology, but because she wants to impose this this outside thing to, to show, you know, actually, are we always in control? But mathematically speaking, the really interesting thing is what she does with the chapter lengths um, and to kind of, again, associated with the, these astrological themes. There are 12 sections or chapters in the book and kind of like the waning of the moon, each chapter is half the length of the one before. So you've got this is in mathematics we call a geometric progression um, where you've got this this constant kind of fraction each time that you multiply by. So there's a very long first chapter and then the next one's half the length, half and half and half. So they quickly and you feel it happening when you're reading the book. Um, the, the chapters are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. That has a really interesting effect when you're reading the book. I mean, you don't necessarily know that that's exactly what's happening. Because actually the, 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 the implication of that mathematically, if you do like a half and then a quarter and then an eighth and then a sixteenth, and something, you never actually get to one. So the whole of the book after chapter one, the total of that is actually less than the length of the first chapter all put together. So when you're reading this book, you don't know what's happening because the first half of the book is kind of all within this first section. And but then as as it carries on it picks up pace you feel kind of the the gears are turning things are getting spiraling in on these two main characters and so you get this quickening of the pace the action is speeding up the 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 sun and the moon characters their fate is being kind of determined around them and it's they're losing control of the situation so it's it makes for a it really good read it's it's a fantastic book and that mathematical structure really adds to it um, and that for me is, a, is an important criterion don't just 
you know, impose some random thing. Don't say every third word must begin with L or something, you know, that you that you could do that. And that's a constraint. But unless there's a compelling reason that this will enhance the narrative, um, then then that will not be worth doing. And it's the same thing in mathematics, because in mathematics, we don't just have any old rules for any old reason. You know, we set up the rules of geometry, for example, the axioms for a reason. It's because we think this is related to what's happening in the real world. That's so we don't have complete randomness in mathematics. And and when you have mathematical constraints or structures in literature, the best ones, the ones that really work are the ones that are done for a good reason and that they enhance and, you know, complement the, the themes and the narrative of the novel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that having this sort of or setting up these sort of constraints, like in the example you explore there, um, I mean, it's not only a matter of structuring uh, the narrative in terms of the number of chapters, the number of paragraphs, for example, and stuff like that, but also, uh, I mean, if we are structuring uh, already the narrative by saying that, oh, it will have X number of chapters, I would imagine that that also has implications in terms of narrative choices right in terms of the content that we will include in each chapter and how the story will probably progress right exactly yes so if you've got a particular plan and how many chapters and the length of the chapter of course in this example the final chapter is extremely short <laughs> just yeah. kind of half a page um and so not much can happen in that chapter but it's the final chapter. So thinking about how that will will end up and, you know, without giving away anything, it, it's a conversation between the two key characters um, by which time, you know, chronologically, that's not the end of the story. So it, it does interesting things with the chronology, this book, it weaves around. Um, and so actually this discussion is somewhere in the middle of the chronology of events. But of course, you are understanding it, knowing everything else that's already happened unlike the two main characters. So yeah, there are these choices um, affect the narrative, affect your choices of how to tell the story in what order, who's, whose voice and so on, absolutely, yeah. And th there's another example where there's a specific number of cha chapters um, and that is kind of done to elaborate on a metaphor that runs through the whole book and it's uh, Life of Pi, a very different book, Yan Martel. And there, there's this lovely symbolism through the book. So it, it, in that book, um, it tells the story of this boy, Pi Patel. So Pi is his nickname because his full name is Piscine, the French for swimming pool. But unfortunately, that sounds like a slightly ruder word in English. Um, and so he, he shorts his name to Pi. That's his name. But he, he meditates through this book, which is... Um, a dreamlike account of a shipwreck at sea and you're constantly not quite sure has this happened you know is he how reliable a witness is he of, of the events that he's recounting but he m meditates through the book on pi his name which is also this mysterious number it's we know what it is it's the ratio of the diameter of a circle to the circumference so in that case we fully we, in that sense we fully know what it is but if you try and write down the number pi, it never ends, it never finishes, it's mysterious, it's irrational. That means in mathematics, it means you can't write it as a as a fraction. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, there's this other meaning in, in English. If someone's irrational, you know, perhaps they're not making logical sense. So is pi irrational is the kind of punning, <laughs> uh, really, subtext of the whole of that novel. And so in the novel, he wishes, he says, I hate you know, the, my 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 name, this number that goes on forever because stories should have an end and a beginning and an end and Pi doesn't. And so he says, OK, Pi may not have an end, but, you know, wouldn't it be great if I can tell this story in exactly 100 chapters? And he does tell the story in exactly 100 chapters. And so he's sort of playing constantly in the novel with the idea of the irrationality of Pi, the fact that Pi goes on forever, but that it's also a ratio we can understand. And he he one of the ways he plays with it is to have exactly 100 chapters. So it does finish, even though pi, the number, <laughs> does not. So uh, there are also other ways in which mathematics manifest in novels and other kinds of uh, writings in this case. So 
Uh, and one of them is how they are sometimes used as symbols in fiction, right? Yes. Uh, so there are, there are several numbers that are used all over the place in fiction, in fairy tales, in folk tales, uh, in religious texts, but there are particular numbers that crop up over and over and over again. And um, three, for instance, is I'm probably the winner of, of these numbers. But, you know, if you think of uh, religious texts, you get lots of threes, but you get twelves and sevens and perhaps 40. Those sort of numbers uh, crop up a lot. Anthropologists call them pattern numbers. And three in particular uh, happens a lot. It occurs a lot in, in stories, particularly fairy tales. So if you think of you know your 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 fairy tales of your youth and of course every culture will have different ones but but i remember there you always get three wishes and there might be three sisters or three witches or three brothers going on a quest um and there are three little pigs there are three billy goats gruff i don't know if that was a fairy tale uh, goldilocks will meet three bears all of these things happen and you can think sort of mathematically why why that might be um, three is a number which is has lots of wonderful mathematical properties but perhaps for narrative the interesting one is that actually if you imagine points if you're just drawing points if you have one point on its own if we think of a story where perhaps there are three princes and they're going on some quest and always what happens in these stories is the first two princes do the same thing and they get it wrong. And then the third one who's, you know, overlooked and the youngest, yeah. but also the best, you know, comes along and succeeds. So if you imagine, OK, we have a point. That's the first prince doing whatever the first prince will do. Well, if you draw a point in the plane, you've just got a point. There's nothing, you know, you don't know. There's no pattern. You don't know what's going on. If you draw another point, then you can then draw a line between them. And in our narrative, what that tells you is you've got a pass, you've set up an expectation. The second prince, he also does the same bad, silly thing, whatever it is. Um, and now you have an expectation. But then, you know, if you draw a third point, you can draw it over here. You subvert the expectation and you've gone up fully a dimension because now you can make a, an actual shape, in, you know, make a triangle. And in the story, the third person does something different. And that is a surprise and that grabs our attention. And you get it in jokes as well. There are lots of jokes where, you know, you have three people and whatever stereotype is prevalent in the country at the time, but there's two normal people and one idiot, right? <laughs> and, and the two normal people do the normal thing and then the idiot does something stupid. Uh, and, and again, it's the same thing. You've set up an expectation which requires two and then three allows you to subvert it. So that narrative structure is very prevalent because of the number three. Uh, and there are you know, other things we could discuss about the number, but yeah, and, and you also get kind of big numbers occur, usually big powers of 10, because of course we count, <laughs> we count in base 10 usually. So you might have hundreds or thousands or, you know, in Ireland, when you go to Ireland, you get 100,000 welcomes. Uh, in China for your birthday, you are, you are uh, you know, you are wished that you will have a hundred birthdays. So these big numbers also appear in kind of phrases quite a lot. Yeah, but it's really interesting to look at, you know, why that might be mathematically. Yeah, it's very interesting because, uh, I mean, some of what you mentioned there, particularly about the number three, uh, here in Portugal, we have tons and tons of jokes, which include uh, three people. It's always yes. the Englishman, the Frenchman, and then because we live in Portugal, the Portuguese. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, yeah. so, and every country will have its its selection of three people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but by the way, I was just thinking about the number seven in particular. I, I mean, just as an example, it just came to mind. But uh, since it's also very frequently used. Uh, I was wondering uh, to what extent that would be culturally influenced because, for example, we have seven days of the week and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Or even if the seven days of the week, along with the use of the number seven in literature, fictional literature, stem basically from the same underlying mathematical uh, I don't, mathematical thing yeah also. yeah i mean that, yeah it's it's an interesting one and it's there's always i think a balance between 
there'll be a mathematical reason and then but there's quite often either a, some sort of cultural reason or a natural reason sometimes there's even a biological reason. I mean, you know, we have, <laughs> this is why we have 10. <laughs> so there's yeah. no mystery to that. And of course, then you can say, well, mathematically, that's why we have stories mentioned hundreds and thousands and, and big powers of 10 as big numbers. And they also, you also get the phenomenon um, where if you want to say some a number is really big, you give a power of 10 and then you add one to it, a thousand and one Arabian nights, for example. Yeah. Um, but in the case of seven, I think there there are various theories about um, why perhaps astronomical reasons why people might think seven is important. Like there was you know a long time ago before telescopes, you could see the sun and the moon, and you knew about the uh, the Earth, and then you could there were only like five planets you could see. So there's somehow seven heavenly bodies that we can that we know that move around kind of thing. Um, so maybe there's something to do with that. But mathematically speaking, I think seven is an interesting number because it's it's a prime number and it's quite small, but it's a prime number. And because of that, uh, you can't break it up in any easy way. So prime numbers, ones that they're only divisible by like themselves and one. Mm -hmm. um, so five is an example, three as well, seven. If you have something like six, you can break it up into twos and threes. And that, although there are some very interesting properties of the number six, um, it doesn't then have this, somehow this strength that a prime number will have. So if you think about rhythms and, and various kinds of poetry, actually, if you want, if you have seven things, you can't break them up into a smaller, smaller bit. So it's got this power of irreducibility somehow. And I think that's probably what's going on there with seven and also with five. Yeah. And what do things like turns of phrase, metaphors, allusions have to do with mathematics? Sorry, say again? Uh, t turns of phrase, metaphors, allusions. Yes. Yeah. So this comes back to what um, we were saying earlier, that actually mathematics and enjoying mathematics does not have to be and historically was not different from being creative and doing these other things so of course everyone's different and people have different likings for different for different subjects but there are lots of authors historically and i'm sure now who enjoy mathematics and it's kind of part of the furniture of their brain and so when they are reaching for a metaphor or an illusion or some imagery sometimes it's a mathematical idea that comes to them so this is, you know, Herman Melville's one of these people. Um, George Eliot is another. James Joyce, they just they enjoy mathematics, and so that might come to their mind as 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 a way to illustrate an idea. And actually, that there's one phrase that we all um, have as as it's a mathematical comes from a ma mathematical problem that's uh, two thousand years old. But certainly in English, we talk about squaring the circle. Uh, as you know, that's a circle you can't square, we'll say, if it's a puzzle, a problem that can't be solved or a difficult question. And I think people, like with all metaphors, you know, you use them without necessarily consciously thinking of what the metaphor comes from. But that to me is it's fascinating that this ancient Greek problem of geometry, which actually is impossible, but it it took, I don't know, 1800 years to prove that you can't square the circle. So this is the problem of if you if you've got a circle, can you draw, a, can you construct with like ruler and compass a square with the same area? That's that's the question. You can't. Um, but this was one of the you know big problems of ancient Greek geometry. Can we do this? And this has entered our our language as as a phrase squaring the circle, which is you know very interesting to me that that, that that happened because it meant at some time there's enough people who genuinely know about this this geometry problem for everyone to go oh yes that is a problem that's very difficult you know so there are these phrases that kind of everybody knows but then specific authors particular authors have just because they like mathematics it sticks in their mind they will use particular allusions that are mathematical and of course i enjoy spotting those <laughs> yeah and so t tell us about a few of those in Moby Dick, since you mentioned that yeah. book earlier. Yes. So Moby Dick, um, of course, it's it's a very rich text. It has lots and lots of uh, 
of metaphor in it and symbolism from you know a huge range of sources and it, to say it's a story of uh going on a whaling ship and uh hunting whales is does not cover in any way what it is of course <laughs> it's not just a, a, a seafaring yarn but uh ishmael uh, the narrator he signs up to, as a deck hand on a whaling ship the pequod and of course then captain ahab takes them on this uh <laughs> ultimately doomed mission to find the, the great white whale moby dick ishmael that just sort of has a lot of he thinks a lot of thoughts and a lot of them are mathematical and um, for example that there are there are times when he's he's looking out at the ocean and he talks about the the infinite progression of the waves and there's this idea again of the uh, of a geometric progression that i mentioned earlier where you know they've got a bigger wave and then a slightly smaller one and a smaller one and a smaller one and that's a nice analogy he talks about the fin of a whale um, as being like the the gnomon of a sundial so the part that sticks up in a sundial and has some mathematical ideas relating to that he uses the whole ship actually as as making a big number he talks about the the hoops circular hoops and then the the sails that are sticking upwards as making a one with loads and loads of zeros after it to represent the, the advanced age of one of the members of the crew uh, fedala um, there, there are the crew members themselves use mathematical illusions. So there are uh, Captain Ahab at one point, he wants to say that the, the cabin boy is very loyal. And he says, you're loyal like the circumference to the center, which is, you know, the circumference of the circle loyally stays always the same distance from the center. So that's a nice illusion as well. And then there are these references by various uh of the of the officers on on board so stub who's the second mate talks about using mathematics texts to to do calculations and he almost finds mathematics like magic so he talks about the cabalistic contrivances of uh, of these mathematical symbols that he's using ahab does calculations on his ivory leg Ishmael loves the data and statistics about whales so much that he has them tattooed on his skin because he had nowhere to write them. So there's all of this going on. Uh, and then just a final one, my favourite illusion or, or discussion is one day Ishmael is just sort of daydreaming again while he's cleaning these great big cauldron like vessels called tripods where they render the, the whale oil very messy and then they have to clean them. And he's just cleaning this thing and he, he notices that Whenever he, he accidentally drops the soap uh, that he's using to clean, uh, that it always reaches the bottom of this big pot in the same amount of time. And he says, this was when I was kind of struck by this fact of geometry that there's a curve where this is true. And the curve is called a cycloid. And it actually that's a curve that was studied by every mathematician you can think of in the, in the 17th and 18th century. Galileo, Newton, Leibniz, Descartes, Fermat. Bernoulli, Mersen, all of them, all of the famous names study this curve. It, it was really, um, it's a fascinating curve. But Melville just drops it in, <laughs> you know, to Moby Dick, which is really lovely to see. And another thing that sometimes writers do in their novels is that they actually feature mathematical themes themselves. Either they are actually sometimes part of the plot or sometimes referenced by, for example, characters or yeah. something like that to explain part of the narrative or to make it more compelling. So what would be some examples of that? Yeah, so we, we mentioned earlier Life of Pi, which is, has this sort of yeah. regular discussion of, of the number Pi compared to the character Pi. Uh, of course, we have to mention Alice in Wonderland <laughs> because that is written by a mathematician, uh, Charles Dodson, who used the name Lewis Carroll for this, uh, for, for his fiction writing. And there are loads of mathematical ideas in, in Alice in Wonderland, but almost the whole the whole book and, and the sequel, Alice Through the Looking Glass, are kind of discussions or explorations of, of logic, mathematical logic, because repeatedly what happens with Alice, there'll be some idea or some strange thing that happens, and it's a sort of strange logic, because it's not something that can happen in reality, but then there are consequences of it. So she uh, shrinks and grows repeatedly in, in, in the book. And if you, if you can shrink to a tiny size, then logically you could swim in a lake of your own tears, right? And that's exactly what happens at the beginning of Alice in Wonderland. So there are these sort of logical consequences and there are various jokes and puzzles around, around 
logic um, and scenes where where people discuss you know this happened and then and then Alice will say oh well if that happened then then the next there's this would result and they say yes and then they get themselves tangled in a logical knot so this kind of reductio ad absurdum idea in mathematics that is a genuine way of proving things in mathematics is really the whole of Alice in Wonderland <laughs> is a one big reductio ad absurdum so that for me that's that's what's going on there um, perhaps close to the surface um, is another book which um, very different in spirit from you know the Moby Dicks and the Ulysses other things we might discuss but Jurassic Park right which of course we probably all seen the film Jurassic Park but it, it was a book first and one of the big themes of that is the idea of um, of chaos theory in mathematics where you can start off um, feeling like you know what's going on but then the system becomes chaotic and kind of exponentially you lose control of what's going on and we know this is a phenomenon in kind of weather forecasting where the, the issue is however close the initial conditions that you put into your model after some time they start to diverge and then you have uh, will have no idea what's going on so to illustrate this idea and it, you know one of the um ways people talk about it is that the butterfly effect right that somehow the difference between a butterfly yeah. flapping its wings or not in the brazilian rainforest two weeks later means there's a hurricane or there isn't so in the context of setting up a theme park full of dinosaurs you know even if you think you know what's going on uh, and got everything set up and under control perhaps that is not what's going to happen so you know that's one of the themes it's discussed in jurassic park and to do that so there's a mathematician character called Ian Malcolm, who is kind of there. His purpose in that book is to explain these ideas and to be the one who's saying, oh, you better be careful. You know, you might get eaten by a Tyrannosaurus Rex. You know, that's he's, he's like the prophet of doom here, explaining mathematically why you should not, um, you know, have such hubris to, to, to do what, what these guys are planning. But in the book itself, there's a really nice um, kind of extra thing which is that the book is divided into seven sections, seven, <laughs> again, seven sections. And at the start of each section, there's a little curious little picture. And each at each section, it's the same picture, but it gets more complicated. And the the this picture is actually um, a mathematical thing called a fractal, which is a, a kind of curve that you produce with a an iterative process so you do the same thing over and over and over again and you might be like each time you have a line replace that line with a with a little zigzag or something and so you you repeat this process over and over again and what you end up with is extremely complicated and hard to predict whereas the first picture is just a few simple straight lines and so that's and again he's using fractals to illustrate the idea of chaos theory, which is already itself mathematical. So that's very nice. And uh, I mean, how accurately do you think this sort of mathematical uh, themes tend to be explored in fiction? Because sometimes, I mean, <laughs> uh, partic yeah. particularly when it comes to, uh, I, I don't know, uh, fiction that is based on uh, crime, or, uh, for example, the, Dan Brown's books, uh, <laughs> Da Vinci Code and all of that. I mean, sometimes it gets a little bit into conspiracy theories. Oh, of course, uh, of course, in that particular case, it's not that uh, I guess he's trying to connect it with uh, real world conspiracy theory. It's just for the sake of the uh, the narrative there. But uh, yet it seems to me that sometimes perhaps uh, writers misunderstand a little bit what they're using there mathematically yeah right i think so there are there are a couple of ways that mathematics can be deployed in in you know a, a less successful way and one of them is where you just have you know you, this might happen more in science fiction maybe but you've got something that you want your characters to be able to do which is essentially impossible and so you drop in some maths person to say ah oh, well i can you know asymptotically uh, integrate the differential matrix of the toroidal surface you know and I, some meaningless phrase and then magically <laughs> the problem is solved so that that can happen just a parachute of some incomprehensible mathsy words strung together yeah. um, that's the possibility another thing that can happen is yeah the, the that your mathematics is 
just not you know may not be correct so in dan brown's books he has a lot to say you know that lots of cryptography mentioned in there so what usually will happen is he'll say some big cryptography words but then actually the characters will have to crack a code that is incredibly easy to crack <laughs> and i i think in one of his books um there was some cipher that they struggled with and then they realized the key to to solving this that there's a number you had to know was a prime number and i won't tell you which book but because i don't want to spoil the enjoyment but but anyway the prime number involved i think turned out to be three which of course is not that is not an uncrackable code. So if you're encoding the whole of the secrets of of you know, the universe, and you know you've got this is ages old, millennia old secret that blows apart, you know, all of Christianity or something, you don't hide it in a piece of paper that just involves a simple anagram. You know, like so that to me, it, I mean, it's fun. Right? I don't mind. I don't object. But it's not really proper cryptography that he's that he's doing there. So yeah, th that's that's one thing. And he he also says a lot about um, the golden ratio, uh, which is to do with the Fibonacci sequence. He says a lot about that that is not really <laughs> not what I would absolutely uh, stand behind as mathematician. Um, so that there's that sometimes. You do also get some sort of tropes around mathematician characters and about you know. D it's a lazy way for authors to say someone's a genius is to make them solve Fermat's last theorem, you know, and find a short little proof of it or, or do some amazing bit of mathematics. And that, that to me is problematic for more than one way. One, one issue with that is that it perpetuates this myth that um, mathematics is some weird thing and you have to be a genius to do it. Otherwise it's completely alien and there's no point even thinking about it which is very, that's incorrect. There are obviously, there are some geniuses in the world, but most mathematicians, we're just normal people who are just happen to enjoy mathematics and like playing around with it and, and it's fun. And you know, we don't insist that to, to engage with music that you have to be a concert pianist. We don't insist that to play football or to go for a run, you have to be an Olympic athlete. So this, that's a weird problematic thing that we do with mathematics to say, either you're a genius and probably insane or <laughs> maths is not for you so the, the 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 stories where you have a crazy person or someone who's driven mad by their mathematical genius they they are not to my taste <laughs> let's say <laughs> yeah and i mean i guess that sometimes these stereotypes that writers might use are just uh, an over simplistic way of getting away with portraying someone as highly intelligent just because they put them in the text doing something or solving a problem but that just so happens that many people out there are just not aware of and and so they don't have the proper let's say cognitive tools to understand that it's much easier to solve yes. than they than they make it or sometimes it just doesn't make any sense at all <laughs> exactly, exactly yeah and you do get um i mean that there are amusing incidents uh that you see that there's a film do you remember the film goodwill hunting came mm -hmm. out a few years ago and yeah. uh, so it has matt damon as this you know ma mathematical genius but he's working as a janitor but the, the moment of you know discovery is when he sees a problem that's been set by the the, the math professor uh, and it left on the blackboard and he just quickly solves it and and therefore he's a genius but if you're a mathematician um who has studied the area that, that this problem comes from is called graph theory and actually it's a really it's an elementary problem that you know you you would set to your undergraduate students um and so yeah th this guy can solve it it's like okay <laughs> it's you know it's, it's like oh it's well okay so you know pythagoras's theorem you know it's a very simple kind of problem so it's, it can be fun if you're a mathematician to just spot those little things that 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 are amusing um but yeah it, it actually there's a, there's a, another amusing instance of that in literature. So uh, one mathematician character in literature that people may have heard of but don't know, remember that they're a mathematician is um, Sherlock Holmes's nemesis, Moriarty. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is in the books you read that he is a mathematician. He he's published you know amazing mathematical texts and he was actually a, a professor of mathematics at, at a university in in England. But then he gives up that maybe maybe the salary isn't high enough. I don't know. <laughs> he gives all that up and becomes the Napoleon of crime. But 
the in the in the one of the Sherlock Holmes stories where he's introduced this character, um, he says that he, he it's his treatise on the binomial theorem that gets him this professorship. And the binomial theorem by that time was, I mean, it was several centuries old, and it was quite elementary. It's it's like being a professor of adverbs or something. You know, it's it's <laughs> it's the wrong example to use. So it's just amusing that Arthur Conan Doyle describes him in this way and he's this genius but his actual dissertation is on a very elementary mathematical theorem yeah i guess that many of this has to do with just suspending your disbelief yes, because yes. it's not only about mathematics but even sometimes particularly in crime stories and all of that i mean there are twists and things that happen that if you stop 10 seconds to think about it, they, they do yeah. not make any sense at all. But if you're just in the moment, yeah. like uh, in the flow, reading the story and all of that, you don't, you don't even notice it. So. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And, you know, I, I have no objection to a bit of, we call it hokum. You know, you, uh, there is no problem with just having a fun yeah. romp. That, that is just takes you along for the ride you know that's completely okay with me um but you know sometimes it's quite funny if you can just spot a little oh, okay that's not right <laughs> yeah and so uh one last topic then what about the idea of mathematics itself i mean when it happens that authors explore mathematics itself in books in stories how do you look at how they tend to present it? Do you think it's accurate or not? I, well, it very much depends. You know, there's a range of ways and range of authors. I think you do sometimes get, the, you know, the, the portrayals of, yeah, the mathematician who is, who is it, a genius, but perhaps an oddball or something. But the ones I really like are where you get mathematician characters who are just, you know, they are they are people. They're people like everybody, with with good parts and bad parts, yeah. um, and they are three dimensional personalities and characters. And where mathematics itself is presented as being kind of interesting and intriguing and fascinating and beautiful, because that's of course how I think of it. And I think one of my favourite authors for doing this um, is the playwright Tom Stoppard, who in several of his plays. Uh, features mathematical ideas and themes and um, my favorite of all his plays is Arcadia which is the story of um, what well, it's set in two times it's set in the present-ish day and in the start of the 19th century and in the, the 19th century part sort of 1809 I think there's this um, young teenage girl Thomasina Coverley who is kind of very good at mathematics and she has lots of exciting ideas she's got ideas that that might kind of pre uh give, give a, a future hint of perhaps fractals but she can't invent fractals yet because you need computers for fractals and then she has these fun discussions about mathematical ideas with her tutor uh but there's also a whole story going on about did lord byron visit the the the, the house and there's this intrigue going on between the present day and and then there's a sort of hint that maybe is this young girl supposed to resemble uh, Ada Lovelace, who is this kind of early mathematician and Byron's daughter, but she is credited with writing the first computer program. So that the, that character, Thomasina, is a joy. She's enthusiastic, she's bright, she's funny, she's silly and all of those things. Um, the mathematics, he gets right. They have this fun discussion of of Fermat's last theorem and he doesn't fall into any of the mistakes that I've mentioned. You know, he doesn't have anyone prove it in five lines and all of this. So they have this fun discussion of this and lots of other ideas and his other plays as well um Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead is another great one which was made into a film actually um about 20 years ago I think and there they have these discussions about probability and if you throw a coin and it comes up heads 90 times in a row you know that could theoretically happen but we it feels wrong so what's going on there why you know how can we understand probability in that context so those are like good examples um but for me yeah the, the best mathematics as you see it in writing and the best mathematicians are the ones that are, are are human beings and and the best you know writers on mathematics get that right and then it's it's fantastic and so let me just ask you one last question 
what were the what were your goals with this book i mean because it's a book for a general audience yes. uh, what would you like for it to be like the what would you like for people to take away from this book particular pe particularly people that i mean they might be able to understand mathematics or but they might think that it's just too boring or perhaps people that think that mathematics is just too hard and they don't even want to try to understand it or something like that yeah so i would say we are human beings are mathematical like our brains are wired mathematically i think that a lot of a lot of people get put off mathematics in school um and actually sometimes it can be boring in school because you have to do the same old calculations over and over and over again you have to learn your times tables that's not very interesting, but to me, that's not what mathematics is. You know, that's okay. Numbers, we have to be numerate fine. It's a skill, but mathematics is about patterns and shapes and symmetries and links between things. And that the fact that that is there in literature for me is so exciting and it's natural because we're human beings. And so our love of rhythm, which is mathematics comes out in all of the creative things that we do. It's there in music, it's there in art, it's there in literature. And if you haven't made friends with mathematics yet, I, I hope that this book will just show you some of the ways in which even quite simple mathematical ideas have such power and can enhance your enjoyment of the books you already know and love and maybe new books and new poetry um, that you haven't yet encountered. So it's not like a, a mathematics textbook. It is uh, just an exploration of how just a few simple ideas that come from mathematics can really enrich the literature we already love and, and new literature we may not yet have seen. So I, yeah, I would encourage everyone to read it because it, even if you don't know yet that you like mathematics, <laughs> you know, you, you, maybe by the end of the book, you might you might have a be, be willing to be friends with mathematics. Yeah, and it's certainly a very fascinating read and the book is again, once upon a prime, the wondrous connections between mathematics and literature. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box of this interview. Uh, Dr. Hart, just before we go apart from the book, would you like to let people know where they can find you and your work on the internet? Yes, yeah, so I'm on, well, we can't call it Twitter anymore. <laughs> But whatever well, I, I still call it Twitter, actually, yeah, but anyway. Yeah. Whatever, whatever that, that bird site, whatever it's called, um, I'm at Sarah Loves Maths with an S on the end. So unfortunately, yes, if you're American, you have to remember to add the S on the end. Um, but you can also, I mean, if you Google me, you'll find my, my Birkbeck website, um, which I try to keep updated, <laughs> although not always successfully. Yeah. Okay, great. So th thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been really fun to talk to you. Thank you. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon and PayPal. The links are in the description down below. And also, please share, like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunde, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Erika Lenny, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Ruinacio Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavanagh, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andre, Francis Forti, Agnunes, Fergal Cousin, Hal Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, John Linares, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hummel, Sadus France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desaraújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Anik Punta, Radan Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madsen, Gary G. Hellman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentin, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stiofanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Morey, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheist, Larry Dealey Jr., Old Harrington, Starry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, 
Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandin, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Paul Crowley, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, B.R. Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hurtner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings and David Pinsoff. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Giancarlo Montenegro, Alni Cortes, Nick Golden and Rosie, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.